Hello, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be watching this. Um, thanks for joining us for Live from NYPL. My name is Aiden Flax Clark and I work at the New York Public Library, so I'm here to welcome you into today's conversation, which is, of course, with journalist and author Carla Power, who will be speaking about her new book, Homeland Security, with Daily Beast columnist Wajahat Ali. Um, if you have a New York Public Library card or you live in New York State and you'd like to get one, you can borrow Homeland Security in both paper and electronic formats. Um, you can find links for that on the event page where you're hopefully streaming this video. And also there, uh, if you'd like to purchase the book, you can do that through the library shop, which of course I would encourage you to do. It's really an amazing read, which um, you will discover in the next hour. Um, that link is also on the event page and uh, please get it one way or the other. Um, Live from NYPL has tons of great programs coming up this fall. Um, just this week on Wednesday, climate scientist uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is going to talk about her new book, Saving Us, and where she finds hope in the battle against climate change. Uh, next week, we are going to have a conversation with doctor and writer Daniel Ofri, comedian Josh Gondelman, and lead MC for the Roots Black Thought about the words that move them. It's going to be an interesting one. Um, and two days after that, on October 7th, Nobel laureate uh, Wole Sienka We'll speak about his first novel in 50 years with acclaimed writer Farah Jasmine Griffin. Um, all of these programs are online, they're all free, and there's lots more past what I described. So go to nypl.org live to see everything that's happening and of course to register. Um, okay, very quickly before I turn it over to today's speakers, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, the library values your privacy and we want you to know that even though the video and the chat are on an NYPL page, they're hosted by YouTube. So if you use the chat, um, you might share data about yourself and the library doesn't control that. Um, lastly, today's conversation is gonna take about 45 minutes. And then after that, there'll be some time for Carla to answer some, some of your questions, which I know she would be happy to do. Um, you can send your questions at any time by using the chat, the Google form, or by emailing publicprograms at nypl.org. Um, we'll make sure that she sees them and she'll get to as many of them as she can at the end. All right, let's get to the conversation. Please welcome Carla Power and Wajahat Ali. Thanks, Aiden, so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in on YouTube. My name is Wajahat Ali, and I'm here with Carla Power, whose book you should read. Hold on a sec. There you go. It's Home, Land, Security, and we're going to go lowbrow and highbrow. High, lowbrow with the Legos, highbrow with brilliant books. And Carla's book just came out two weeks ago. She is a Pulitzer nominated author and journalist who joins us, I think, all the way from England. Is that correct, Carla? That is correct. Yes. So, post. you know, I, I read your book and I, I we've chatted before and, you know, you're a you're a mom, you're a nice person, you, 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 you're all around pleasant uh, individual. Uh, you watch movies like Train Spotting and you understand my 80s references and you're a wife. And so what inspired someone like you after the election of Donald Trump to travel all around the world and hang out with former violent extremists, violent jihadis known as like, you know, the beheader and their relatives in places like Indonesia, Pakistan and, and uh, Europe. Well, I've, I've always been really interested in, in sort of the cogs and wheels of how uh, societies create others. And I've been writing about that for a long time. I've also been really eager to uh, find common ground with people whose worldviews are very different from my own. My, my first book, uh, If the Oceans Were Ink, was about this sort of um, odd couple relationship, friendship I had. Uh, I'm Quaker, Jewish, feminist, American with a very traditional uh, Muslim scholar raised in a village in India and madrasa trained. And the idea was to read the Quran together and see what common ground we could find. And we found a, a fair amount of, of um, common ground. But with the election of Donald Trump, uh, it occurred to me as I was feeling increasingly radicalized, increasingly unable to accept other people, my fellow countrymen's worldviews, that I had always sort of batted away the writing or thinking in any depth about Islamic, uh, Islamist 
extremists. I'd, I'd always said, oh, you know, that has nothing to do with Islam. Let's talk about peace and pluralism and harmony. And it suddenly occurred to me, what was I afraid of? Why wasn't I really trying to engage with this tiny minority, but nonetheless, um, a recurrent theme, uh, certainly in Western media reports? You know, uh, and, and so you went on this journey, you were inspired, uh, and you know, it's totally normal for a Quaker a Jewish scholar to spend time reading the Quran with, you know, a traditionally trained uh, imam or, or student from uh, Madras, totally normal. It's just like basically our Wednesday. And so, you know, you were inspired in this inquiry. It started with your first book, which is a Pulitzer nominated book, If the Oceans Were Ink. And, you know, you say, okay, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to go talk to these violent extremists. I'm going to go talk to these former violent jihadis. I'm going to go to Denmark. I'm going to go to England. I'm going to go to Indonesia. And, and you are still Carla Powers. You are from appearances, you know, uh, someone around my age who's a mom, who's white, uh, who's coming from England. And you go, hi, how's it going? I'm a journalist. My name is Carla. Uh, can you please like open up your life to me? Like how did they respond to you and this project? And how did you win over that type of trust that's needed for them to open up the way they did in this book? I, I wish I could say that there was some sort of journalistic voodoo that I did. Um, I think it was actually much simpler than that. Um, that I, nobody else seemed all that interested in these sorts of stories. There were occasional, you know, um, rushes on individuals, but uh, someone who was willing to put aside her preconceptions, sit down, and do, um, as they say, deep listening, mm. uh, was rarer on the ground. People, particularly in say, Indonesia and Pakistan, really wanted to tell their stories. I also have to nod a little bit at the possibility of white privilege, mm. that there was something about having an American travel that far and, being allowed, um, you know, being interested that that allowed me to swan into living rooms I, I that other folks might have had more problem getting into. So I'm not discounting that notion, but um, in particularly in in places like Indonesia and Pakistan, where former militants aren't necessarily in jail or completely ostracized from society, it wasn't that hard. You know, I, I, I want to talk about Indonesia, which is actually the most populous Muslim country in the world. Sometimes people don't know that. And you, you talk about when you went to Indonesia specifically, there was a conference of former extremists and uh, you were hanging out with them and they said, hey, you want to come to our Quran study? And you're like, sure. And in particular, you had the chance to meet a gentleman by the name of uh, Hassan al-Din, the beheader. And that title is a literal title because he openly admitted that he was an extremist who used to behead specifically women, young women. Uh, and now he's on the path to uh, trying to reform himself. And you, got, you were stuck in an elevator with a man named Hassan al-Din the Beheader. And you wrote, quote, my will to understand sputtered out, doused in revulsion. And my refusal to hum humanize Hassan al-Din the Beheader, I felt undermined aspects of my own humanity. It blocked off my capacity to be curious, to listen, to at least search for a defense of the indefensible. Uh, some will read all of this and hear what you said, how you went on this journey to listen to some of the worst people on earth. And they'll say, you are using this project to normalize and whitewash monsters. Uh, they don't deserve our time. They don't deserve our sympathy. So how would you respond to someone critical uh, of you, say, spending time trying to understand a former Nazi or a literal beheader of women? Well, I would start off by saying, you know, monsters are for fairy tales and fairy tales are for children. We really need to, in some way, try to understand why these horrible things take place. I would never condone, I would never excuse political violence and governments have a whole raft of measures that they can use to try to combat it. But one of these surely has to be having discussions about the root causes of extremism and terrorism. 
what, why are all these people drawn to it? Uh, what is it that, what are the, what are the many reasons? And it, it seems so basic. And yet I feel that for certainly in the United States for the past 20 years, those discussions have been very thin on the ground. And oftentimes those discussions have anchored themselves around this thing called Islam and Muslims. Terrorism equals Muslim, terrorism equals foreigner, terrorism equals immigrant. But in the United States of America, and you've, done, you've seen the data in the last 10 years, the number one source of domestic extremism and terrorism and terrorist violence comes from white power movements. The resurgence of white supremacist movements both here and in Europe. And you know, you're talking about, you, you mentioned these extremists, the pathway towards radicalization, which we could talk about in a bit, but I'm curious in your, in your research, are there similarities across these violent extremists? Because oftentimes what we do is we, in a way, fetishize Muslim violence and see that as the norm. And then when it comes to white supremacist violence, they're seen as lone wolves or lone radicals. Absolutely. Um, I think, I think, you know, particularly since 9-11, the baseline for terrorism has been the Islamist terrorist. Um, and if you look at the stats, I think um, statistically, Islamic terrorism gets like three or four times the coverage that other sorts of political extremism get. Um, exoticism sells. Yeah. And, um, and, and that that sort of marbles into the Islamophobia industry, which you, of course, have written the text on. Um, but I think that, that the inability for us to sort of look for the banality behind Islamic extremists. I mean, Hannah Arendt wrote about the banality of evil. And for us to dig down and see the rather ordinary reasons that many of these people are attracted to these groups hasn't happened with Muslims uh, because they are exoticized in the first place. And I think, you know, the stake of creating this existential threat that is uh, the, the, the Muslim terrorist, there are a lot of stakeholders in that. And there are a lot of people who, who have, have have poured, you know, political campaigns have been run on it and wars have been waged on it and uh, overseas, you know, uh, various regimes are, are benefiting from the fear of the Islamic terrorist in the sense that they, they sort of say, you know, there but for the grace of God, uh, you will, we, will, we will have an Islamic terrorist threat again. So I think there, there are many reasons that we haven't been able to grapple with um, the root causes. Um, you know, I, I wanna to go to the root causes, but it's interesting because that, that terror industry thrives off of creating villains. And, you know, we just acknowledged the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the research and data shows that, you know, these, this villainization continues for politics, for profit, for ideological purposes, right? The, the narrative that's been going on in Europe and now in America is that Muslims and foreigners and those who come from shithole countries won't integrate. They're going to cause a popper, uh, demographic explosion and, and replace us, right? There's something inherent within them and their beliefs that causes and them, drives them towards extremism. And then your book shows exactly what you said, the banality of the evil, there are other factors. And oftentimes uh, the DNA of violent extremists, whether it's a white supremacist or someone who joins ISIS is very similar. And I'm curious, why do you think 20 years on, we are unable to catch up with this reality? Whether it's media or politics, like how come we're still lagging when the data is so clear? When the data is clear, but you know, there are a lot of people who, there, there is a really ingrained narrative mm. in terms of the Muslim as the other. And I was shocked, you know, how ingrained it was myself even as someone who's written for decades on trying to explode stereotypes of the Muslim other and to show um, similarities. You know, the, the first mother of uh, a, a, a terror, of an ISIS terrorist I went to see, I was at the Birmingham train station and I was looking for a woman in a niqab um, and instead a woman in stiletto heels with a Welsh accent who is a social. 
Carla, you have frozen. Uh, I can't hear you, but hopefully you can come back to me. Uh, Carla is discussing the, this fascinating story about a mother uh, she met in Birmingham, uh, whose daughter, uh, whose son actually, uh, born and raised in Birmingham, uh, you know, perfectly quote unquote normal life, uh, went on a pathway towards radicalization. And basically this young, this young boy then goes off to join ISIS. And so Carla goes and talks to uh, this mom and it, it's, you know, she doesn't wear a niqab. For those of you who don't know, I think this is good 20 years on. A hijab is when you, you know, you see women covering their hair. Burqa is what you see in Afghanistan. Niqab is when you see them covering their face like this. I think oftentimes people put it all together. Um, but she sees a, a mother uh, who looks like, I guess, the classic traditional European uh, mother, which is always, uh, unfortunately, just seen as white. And she sits there and goes, I don't know, I don't know what happened. Uh, this is what happened to my son. And it's interesting in the book, and, and until Carla comes back to us, how Carla goes and talks to this mom. And the mother is reviled by the community. They're, the mother is rejected by the community. And now anyone who's a parent, I'm a parent, I got three, I got three kids. She is simultaneously trying to figure out how to get her son back. But the meanwhile, you know, her son, they, they, she kind of shares these messages that the son gives where like she's trying to de-radicalize him, but the son's far too gone. But at the same time, he still has, you know, this, this really interesting like he just resorts back to this kid who's talking to his mom and also how sometimes uh, our society doesn't necessarily empathize with the relatives of these individuals. It reminds me um, of this great movie based on a book. Uh, we need to talk about Kevin. We're in this movie. Uh, the, the son of the, the mother, Tilda Swinton, becomes radicalized one day and goes, you know, kills a lot of these school students, uh, kills the husband and kills also the daughter. And the whole community turns on the mother who, for what we've seen at least, is uh, a mom who uh, has done everything right. And so Carla kind of goes and talks to this mom who uh, is still trying to piece together the, the shattered life of, of what happened. Uh, and oh, here we go, uh, Carla, connecting to audio. I tried my best to pretty much uh, give everyone an introduction as to this mom who you met in Birmingham how she was trying to pretty much understand how her son, who was quote unquote perfectly normal when got radicalized, how she still had to be a mother, but she was still kind of revolt, she was still rejected by, by that community. And so speaking about moms and relatives, I think you spend like, you know, it's really humanizing in a way and really powerful. You spend a long time with relatives who are trying to figure out what happened. How do you think society should engage with like say the mothers or fathers of these kids where everything was quote unquote normal and one day lo and behold the kid goes and joins ISIS. I mean it was it was fascinating to see these parents uh, absolutely you know pacing back over you know the years leading up looking for clues as any parent would who was worried about you know a kid um, going a little bit off the rails. And it was exactly that, that sort of thing. I should say that uh, for a while, there was very much a vogue uh, in the counterterrorism in sort of um, space to uh, court mothers, to get mothers to uh, be sort of the eyes and ears. And that was quite controversial because some of them um, felt like, wait, I'm being asked effectively to spy on my own children. Mm. And as another mother said to me, she was like, I work full time, I'm raising a family and now I have to fight terrorism too. So it was, um, there, there is a questionable thing about making parents or mothers the gatekeepers for yeah. these children. Um, on the other hand, um, I, I can't imagine, I mean, the reason I started the book with mothers is because nothing humanizes someone more than a mother. Monsters mm -hmm. don't have mothers. And so to talk to the families and to talk to people who had a sense of these people before they became terrorists and who had hopes for them after they became terrorists was a really useful um, exercise for me because it, it, it enlarged my scope of, of what these people were like. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's easy to say these people have horns on their head and they, you know, breathe sulfur and they carry tridents, but they're just people. 
and and in particular you, when you went and talked to a young one young woman uh, afifa in indonesia she was a teenager and her parents thought everything was going normal and she becomes radicalized and says ah isis has a their version of the caliphate this is wonderful i'm going to leave my family in indonesia and go join syria and from your data and your research you know why did these young women decide to go join an extremist group, which is barbaric and so misogynistic. What was the appeal, you know, sitting all the way to Indonesia, sometimes in, in Europe for these, for these young women to say, that's what I want out of my life. Well, Afifa was extraordinary because not only did she go, but she, she along with an uncle convinced, convinced 26 members of her oh. extended family to go. They all made the trek to the Islamic State for a variety of reasons. And Afifa was a, was a really, in, in some ways typical, but in other ways, very atypical case in that she got dazzled online. Mm. Um, the Islamic State had a very savvy propaganda campaign where you know there were influencers, particularly talking to young women. And there's some interest, there were, fascinating blogs where the blogs would be this mix of kind of little house on the prairie pioneering spirit mm. with um, sort of quasi erotic promise about these uh, th these fighters who were very lonely and needed wives out there and needed company. Um, but in Afifa's case, Afifa was, and so she, she sort of saw it as a place that her family could go start afresh. She was, the family was upper middle class. Mm. Her father was a high level civil servant. And yet Afifa kept saying, look, we can go down. You know, there's, there's this kind of mix of nostalgia for the age of the prophet purportedly what the prophet's uh, age was. And also a sense that you can start anew. You can, you can have all the, the, the hassles of modernity, are stripped away and you can just focus on a pious existence. And mm. that was what Afifa bought into. She wasn't, you know, she didn't hate the West. She didn't hate the Indonesian government. This was not an ideological thing. It was, you know, believing these online recruiters who would tell her anything she wanted to hear. And for a 16 year old um, who was a little bored, very bright, and wanted more time, wanted her dad to spend more time at home. Um, she was literally like telling her dad, well, you can have better work-life balance there. You don't even have to work. They're telling me you don't even have to get a job out in Raqqa. And I, the family is a really interesting mix of the sorts of things that people wanted. I mean, they're, they're you know, one aunt wanted, uh, better care for her autistic son. Mm. Uh, a sister wanted a um, to possibly go to medical school, which which the ISIS recruiters assured them would be free. Uh, the grandmother wanted to die in blessed Shams in Syria, and she was and so a a whole group of them from the age of two to eighty six made the voyage from Indonesia through Turkey and and into Syria. And we're sadly very, very disappointed with what they found. Yeah, it's, it's this romanticized, idealized version of a past that didn't exist. Uh, it's this narrative that sells to so many people who, who become extremists. Uh, it simplifies the world and says, you too can create this glorified past and you could be a co-protagonist of this new narrative. Exactly. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, live freely with justice and decency. And yes, some eggs have to be cracked. Some people might have to be beheaded, but this is the cost. And, you know, you're saying this family, this upper middle class family, there's a young girl, there's some people, everyone thinks, oh, everyone who becomes an extremist is, is poor. That's not, that's not the case. And so, you know, I, I have an assumption here, but I want you to, you know, maybe correct me or edify me. There seems to be no particular formula or pathway towards radicalization. Uh, are, are there factors that nonetheless seem to pop out more than others? And correct me if I'm wrong here. There are certainly factors, both, on, and both for Islamists and for right-wing extremists, um, you know, whether it's isolation or loneliness or wanting to be part of something bigger than yourself or transcendence. But 
You're absolutely right. There are so many, you know, you read the UN report on the number of push factors and the number of pull factors. Mm -hmm. And it's like, by the end of it, you're like, this is all of society. It's everything everything. from, it's, and I think, I think it's, that's, that's actually really, really trenchant because Mm -hmm. It's so marbled into modern life, the many, many reasons. Um, And to the point where experts who have been studying this for much, much longer than I have, like Mark Sageman, um, who's been studying it for for decades, says, you know, we really don't know what pushes people over um, from having radical thoughts or from feeling drawn to extremism actually into political violence. What what tips them over. It's still a little bit of a black box. Um, And there's not a conveyor belt, you know, from disaffected youth to ISIS squatty, you know, that- That 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 was the analogy after 9-11, right? The conveyor belt theory of radicalization. If you just understand this and take them off the conveyor belt, but then you see some outliers, you see an upper middle class person, you see an engineer, you see someone who's wealthy, you see someone who's Islamically illiterate, who barely knows anything who Absolutely. really buys, you know, uh, Islam for dummies. And, exactly. uh, and, 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 and so, you know, I, I want to talk about how, you know, governments, specifically Western governments, kind of, you know, by failing to understand, by failing to listen, by kind of taking a big hammer and attacking the nail might have made things worse. And your book does talk about that. But right before I get there, so I don't forget, uh, I saw this, this stat in your book, which I thought was fascinating about, you know, one of the pathways towards radicalization you said a 2016 internal report from Facebook found that 64, 64% of people who join an extremist group on the platform did so only in response to a Facebook algorithm. That was stunning. You know, in your travels and in your journalism, how much of a factor did Facebook and social media play in radicalizing these people or introducing them towards, introducing them towards violent extremism? I think... You know, in in the Western context, you know, online social media is a big, you know, is is one of the big factors um, towards, you know, extremist and extremist um, talking shops. That said, it, it's really important for us to ground ourselves in where most terror acts happen. It is mostly in, it's mostly Muslims. Uh, um, uh, most Islamist terrorism ends up targeting other Muslims. Yeah. And so it is, you know, you've got, you've got, you know, when you have um, people out in remote villages in the Swat Valley in Pakistan, that's not going to be social media, you know, um, they're not going to have access to a computer. So as you say, um, if you're looking at the lo- at localized um, issues, um, poverty is very important when you're in when you're talking about you know the people joining the Pakistani Taliban or the Afghan Taliban. Um, but certainly, when you look at it from a Western point of view, social media takes um, a, a, a big part of it, and it and it has been. But but again, you can also flip it. You know, you look at stats of. Um, people who, who um, suicide bombers, for example. Robert Pape at the University of Chicago looked at suicide bombers between, uh, for about 30 years, 95% of them were reacting to the fact that their countries were occupied. Mm. So you can cut it a lot of different ways. And I think we've been focusing on social media because we're in the West and it's been in the news, but there are so many other factors that we shouldn't lose sight of those. And one of them is US foreign policy. And you know, for those of us who have been in the space and traveled the Muslim majority countries, you know, they did a poll in 2009, Gallup did a poll of about a billion Muslims. And they said, oh, you know, what do you, what do you love about the West in America? And, you know, we heard this narrative, oh, they hate our freedoms. It was actually the exact opposite. They loved us for our freedoms, our technology, our education, our opportunities. Then said, okay, what do you hate about America? And the number one thing that they hated was the hypocrisy and the disconnect between our values and our foreign policy and the disrespect towards Islam and Muslims. And oftentimes when the rest of us say, you know, foreign policy is a factor, not the factor, but a factor, this still gets shut down in 2022 America. Well, 2021, I jumped a couple of months. You know, people don't want to talk about 
the war on terror. They don't want to talk about our support for dictators. They don't want to talk about the drone strikes. But your book actually goes into that. You say, no, like when you talk to these Muslims, many of them are like, foreign policy is one of the major factors here for some of these individuals who take up arms. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I remember talking to uh, a, a young Indonesian militant and I was like, okay, all right, let's just say, let's just say that you, you are king for a day. How would you stop terrorism tomorrow? And he's like, easy, get America to pull out of other countries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was simplistic and so on. But that was certainly the narrative that this young ISIS and Al Qaeda supporter had. Um, I would argue that, um, you know, just like all politics is local, uh, we've got to think about terrorism as being local. There are so many local issues ranging from corruption, ranging from gender issues and so on that drive people towards these groups that um, I often think that American foreign policy uh, is, is, is cited, but there are, there are other reasons driving people towards it. But I totally agree. I can't draw a straight line between American foreign policy and terrorism, but it's certainly an influence. And I mean, the optimistic thing is, it can cut the other way. It right. wasn't always thus, you know. Um, the idea that there's, you know, a, a JFK Boulevard in Lebanon, or that we were extolled by by Iranians for for a long, long time, um, comes as a surprise to me. So I'm I'm hopeful that if we if we stop thinking about zone, drone strikes and and move to something else, it it we can turn the tide. I, you know, speaking about stopping de-radicalization, before we go local, and your book does go local, and I want to bring it back to the homeland, let's go macro for a second. You spent time, I didn't even know this existed, at the Security and Counter-Terror Expo. Apparently, they have expos for everything now. Uh, I, and I shouldn't be shocked this exists, but alas, there you were. And you mentioned in your book this policy of, quote, securitization. Can you define and explain this phenomenon, especially after 9-11 and how it's contributed to this policy of counter-radicalization and counter-extremism. Absolutely. Um, securitization is this thing coined by political scientists where the idea that where a, a political act or a political people are deemed so intrinsically important to national security mm. when, you, when a country is facing um, an existential threat that the entire group of people or political action becomes a security issue, a security threat. And that very much happened post 9-11, as, as, as you know, you know far better than I, I, th I would suspect, um, with American Muslims who suddenly the most ordinary, ordinary activities of life are seen as security threats, whether it's going to the mosque, or growing a beard or, um, or praying, you know, that these things are suddenly um, security threats because we are facing an existential mm -hmm. civilizational threat. And so everything has to be securitized. Yeah, and that's what happened with the NYPD's mass surveillance of Muslim communities that was exposed in the AP article. But if you looked at some of the factors that the NYPD had towards, you know, look out for these factors and person might be radicalized. I'm like, holy crap, they're talking about me halal meat, going to like the mosque to pray every Friday, once in a while wearing Muslim clothes. I'm like, everyone I know is a, apparently an extremist. Um, and, and you see the, the only utility then, and the only purpose of 4 million American Muslims is to help fight ISIS. And you become a threat. And specifically going on a local level from this macro lens, which I think both of us would agree was uh, deeply counterproductive. You know, the government, the United States government had this program called CVE countering violent extremism. And so the, you focus on Minneapolis. Minneapolis, for those who don't know in Minnesota, has a very large Somali population. Many of them originally came as refugees and immigrants, and now they have like, you know, the part and parcel of, uh, of Minnesota. But some of these young men became radicalized and they went and joined Al-Shabaab. And so Minneapolis then becomes like this local target for this post 9-11 securitization policy. And you would think that CVE done by the government and they said, oh, look, we're working with local leaders. They're, they're, they're partnering up with us. It was a massive failure and rejected by the very same community they were allegedly trying to help. Why did it fail? Well, I, I should say that the one de-radicalization 
sort of experiment happened in Minneapolis. And as far as I can tell, that was successful. Oh, and it was, that was okay. from, um, from, from a group that, that did get CVE funding, but there was great suspicion of, of um, CVE uh, in Minneapolis because um, relations were so terrible between um, uh, security forces and and the Somali community. The FBI would, according, you know, um, Arun Konani's uh, The Muslims Are Coming has these amazing descriptions of um, the FBI, you know, surveying um, Somalis in malls, at schools, at, at um, being being very you know driving by and taking youth off the street, um, and so it was a very very suspicious um, situation, and it divided the community. Those I, I talked to mothers who wanted to wanted to help authorities talk to them about their their sons and how worried they were about their radicalization, but they were dismissed by their own community as snitches. Mm. And when you get this divided, divisive, divisive tactic, um, we shouldn't be surprised. Um, this is why I'm so keen on grassroots initiatives that are inclusive rather than um, securitized. And, and what, and you said in Minneapolis, one of the programs that worked, why was that one successful? Well, it, it had, uh, it was an experiment. It had a, a exactly um, one person who went through it, who, who was extraordinary, I think. Um, he was, uh, you know, a, a young man stopped at the airport um, for wanting to fly off to Turkey and it was thought then to Syria. He was in prison and um, a, a, an extraordinary woman named Mary McKinley uh, recruited a young Somali high school teacher to go into prison and have a, basically a civics reading course with this young man in prison. And they read Ta-Nehisi Coates and they read Martin Luther King and they discussed Aristotle and Plato. And over the course of his prison sentence, this relationship was very important. And law officers and the judge who had taken a risk on this sole sort of de-radicalization program at the time in the United States and said, okay, you can work with him, um, made, made um, Yusuf Abdullahi, you know, changed him. And, and two years later, he was, he was out and um, is, is, you know, is, is seen as a great success story. You, you, you tr another part of this book is you travel around the world and, and, and investigate some of these de-radicalization programs and see where it went right, where it went wrong. You spent time in Minneapolis. You also went to Denmark and, and looked at the Danish model of, of mm -hmm. trying to you know, install these civic values of the good life, uh, specifically trying to get like, you know, Muslim immigrants and, and those who uh, they deemed as foreigners to kind of buy into the Danish concept of the good life. What uh, worked or didn't work with the Danish model? Well, the, the town I spent time in was called Aarhus, and it has a very famous um, de-radicalization program that it's, whose critics call it a hug a terrorist program because it is so welcoming that the police officers and detectives have a little yellow house. It looks like it's out of hands, Christian Anderson. And you walk in and the, there, you know, there's a, a kid's um, a kids play area and there are coffee cups set out. And this is to get families of extremists and the extremists itself, guys coming back from Syria during the ISIS um, time would come in and talk to the detectives there. And the detectives would say very frankly, we are here to help you. What, as one detective in Copenhagen put it to me and he was in charge of their de-radicalization program, our question to these guys is not, what's your problem? It's, what is your problem? How mm. can we help you? How have we failed you as a society? And so in Aarhus, there are guys who were, you know, returning, returning ISIS, um, you know, supporters who would get um, help with finding apartments, psychiatrists, jobs, family counseling, whatever it took to get them to come back into the fold of Danish life. Now, I should say that this also happened against a backdrop of increasingly punitive measures 
um, by the Danish government at large. So this was this was a an experiment in um, in this particular town. But the, but the, but the notion is if we can help people back into this this wonderful safety net. Um, then, then hopefully we won't have terrorism anymore. I mean, if this is alongside um, other very punitive measures, um, but in Aarhus at least, they seem to have a pretty good track record. Reintegration, rehabilitation, forgiveness, giving them an off ramp, not just prosecuting them, sentencing, sentencing them, putting them in prison, marking them for life. And you, I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's just one town, but you're saying that that seems to work at least in that town. At least in that town, the people I met, it did. Um, yeah, um, you know, it wasn't always perfect, and that you know, the talking to people in both, say, Germany and Denmark, you know, often they would say, you know, we can tackle we can tackle the extremism, but often there are underlying other social issues that are much, much deeper um, that will link these people to violence or so on. So, um, you know, again, it's the lens, it's the security lens that stops you from looking at the bigger context about the person. Um, but the most successful de-radicalization programs, whether they're in Pakistan or in Germany are very much about looking at the whole person rather than just you know, their worst moments or their worst instincts. You know, you spoke about Pakistan. My family's from Pakistan. I've been many times. And, and you talk about this uh, de-radicalization program they have called Paimon. And I'll read a quote from your book. It said, quote, by removing her veil and showing her face, Selma was using Paimon's core rehabilitation philosophy to remind violent extremists of their own humanity. Recruiters incite people to commit violence for a political goal by stripping away their humanity dignity and identity, end quote. You know, it seems like pie in the sky, but does this actually work? And if it does, why did this succeed where other policies failed? I think in the Pakistani context, in the context of trying to de-radicalize um, young men who were brought into um, the Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban in the Swat region, Often they, they came from families where they were very poor, very badly educated, had no critical skills, and often whose parents were so overrun that, that nobody really gave a damn about them. So Paimon, um, Selma's a very specific case where she actually stops a, a, a slaughter um, and a, a suicide mission um, by by lifting her veil and showing her face to her brother. Uh, but more generally, Paimon is very much about trying to care about the individual boys. That the the brigadier general who runs it says a lot of these kids have never, you know, when he says when's your birthday or what color do you like or who are you there's a real that they'll be like huh you know because no one has given a damn except for a very brief time the taliban recruiters who have lured these kids with you know the promise of a ride in an suv or uh a lunch money or you know some sort of very meager um, because this is such a poor area, very meager enticement. But to have to work with these young men and to show them that they are more than just, um, you know, the, the fifth in line of their 10 person family seems to work well in Paimon's case. And that's very much sort of building up the notion of a self as opposed to just, just uh, a problem for your parents. You know, and, and from what I've heard so far, what you say, you know, this type of deep investment in humanizing these individuals and communities seems to work. It, it takes longer. It's not as flashy. You don't have like the guns blazing and the Monday night football soundtrack, uh, but it seems to actually work. And I compare that to the 20 year war on terror, two trillion dollars wasted in Afghanistan, <laughs> the immense, you know, a national security industry that flourished, you know, DHS uh, surveillance, which made things worse. And we wasted 20 years and we wasted millions of trillions of dollars. And, you know, we radicalized individuals and our trust deficit with these communities, both here and abroad, seem to just increase. And you wish you could just take the DeLorean back in time and put more <laughs> sane heads at the top and say, listen, let's take a step back. You know, we got to be strong. We have to respond. Sure. 
but we also have to invest. And it seems like those, you know, those underlying factors uh, that went untreated, the, the demons are rising again, right? Uh, the ghettoization, the racism, the xenophobia, uh, the securitization. And specifically, I want to focus on Germany because a lot of people used to see Germany. You mentioned this in your book. Look at Germany. It went through its period of radicalization. It went through World War I and World War II. It went through Hitler and Nazism. And, and Germany has invested so much of their curriculum and their society into making sure this doesn't happen again, right? And, and they do it through, quote, unquote, working through the past, unlike what's happening in America right now, where they're trying to ban critical race theory in elementary schools and ban any discussions of, of, uh, of even talking about white supremacy. Germany did the opposite. They're, they're like, no, no, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll work through the past and we'll make sure that we own it and that we're, our, our citizenship is aware. But what you're seeing now is the rise of the AFD movement, the rise of xenophobia, the rise of uh, nativists, the rise of right-wing movements who are aligned with other right-wing movements in Europe and America. And so specifically, why isn't it working anymore in Germany? And you mentioned this in your book. I'm just very curious. I mean, I think one thing we have to be clear about is the, the, the sort of status project of saying, okay, everybody, we're gonna turn around and we're gonna stare history in the face. That happened in West Germany. So after reunification, you had, you had a lot of people in East Germany, there was a really, really lively uh, neo-Nazi underground thing under the communists. And so, and the, while the West had been, had been very much sort of, you know, we are gonna make a constitution that will outlaw any, any political parties that are too extreme. If we need to be, we're gonna have this eternal clause that, that means that, that um, you know, another Hitler will never come to, come to power through dem democratic means again. But in East Germany, there, there had been, you know, a, a really, um, a, strong right-wing scene during under communists. And this, this sort of um, festered and when reunification happened and there was a huge sort of upheaval, um, this allowed the extremists on the, in the West and the, and the East to, to so you, unite and strengthen. I would also say that, that I think the rise to um, far right is, is, is happening be, because for the same reason that it's happening everywhere, people are scared. They're grasping at um, cer so-called certainties um, and scapegoats in, um, in a world in flux. Um, so- and, and people oftentimes latch onto conspiracy theories when they feel absolutely. that the world is not under their control anymore. Something simple to give them like a type of balance. Absolutely, it's very attractive to have um, a right and a wrong, um, a black and a white. Um, we we grasped at it after after nine eleven. You know George Bush's famous speech: "You're either with us or you're with the terrorists." Right. Where does that leave people who you know have problems with American foreign policy, but certainly don't you know loathe what the terrorists stand for? So. No, we, um, we have questions now. And, and you know, speak about conspiracy theories. The first question is, is about QAnon. And it's seen as a now, according to the FBI in 2020, it's a, seen as a domestic terror threat. And they warned about QAnon in particular radicalizing both individuals and a potential mob. We saw the January 6th insurrection. We saw how Ashley Babbitt, a veteran, was literally radicalized and is now seen as a martyr. And so the question we have, have here is when people talk about, quote, deprogramming, Americans who subscribe to QAnon and other similarly dangerous conspiracies. What insights on that question might you have picked up in your travels in the book? Well, I think I think one of the the sort of there are two tenets. The first is from a German de-radicalizer, a former neo-Nazi himself who works with with neo-Nazis now, and he said, "Look, our approach is." We, lo we, we do not, we accept you as a human. We do not accept your Nazi beliefs. Sure. And they sit down and try to make connections with people um, 
uh, in in other parts of their humanity, other than and so on. I I I also I mean I would be very cautious about using the term deprogramming or even deradicalization. I mean, you know, we have freedom of speech and freedom of thought, and that is one of the reasons we don't have you know federal deradicalization programs that that tell people what to think. You don't we we don't like to touch that as Americans. Um, what in, in terms of QAnon, um, you know, I, I think we've got to look at wider contexts here. We've got to turn the telescope around and look at everything from physical isolation to, you know, the pandemic, which certainly has stoked um, people's isolation, people's online presence, all sorts of other, you know, one, one expert called it, a, you know, just an absolute um, perfect storm for radicalization and extremism uh, to have everybody sitting at home just watching their own opinions reflected back at them. So I, you know, I'm not an expert in QAnon by any, any means, but, um, you know, whether it's the Indonesians who are very intent on mixing up society, taking extremists out of their own networks and putting them in with other mainstream folk to mix it up so that somehow they can, they might be able to have a broader view of, of society to the Germans who are willing to invest for, you know, one-on-one -on -one counseling for years and years and years and years to get people to look beyond their, their own hatred. Um, you know, I think we can learn from other, other societies, but obviously QAnon is a very American problem. So we'd have to tailor it to our own, our own uh, soil. But there are similarities. And I think the reason it's important you keep mentioning this is because they're human beings, right? Uh, and, and human beings are complex. And we have this question, you know, you've been able to find the humanity in radicalized violent people past the idea that they're quote monsters. For others who can't or won't see that humanity, how do you try to bring them around to your point of view other than writing this excellent book, of course? Um. Well, I would I would ask I I I would cite Brian Stevenson, um, who who wrote that marvelous book on just mercy, and who said, you know, look, and this was about people who were you know imprisoned for life. Are do, do we all want to be judged for the absolute worst thing we've ever done? Um, surely we want to try to understand why somebody does something rather than just condemning them as evil. Evil is a, is a blunt instrument and it's a dead end and it's not terribly interesting for starters. You really, um, I, I, would, I would encourage people to be curious and compassionate and go look for what uh, what drew these people there? And I, I would also say that it has a lot to do with the societies they're in. This is, these are not, you know, statistically, people who join violent extremist groups aren't, don't have mental illness any more than any other folks in the population. You know, these are rational choices many of these people are making. Yes, these groups also, you know, open their arms to people who are fragile or, or um, you know, who, who may have problems, but Statistically, it, these are rational choices being made. And I think that's the hardest thing for us to understand that there are things in our societies that are driving them in towards this. So we have four minutes left and I wanna hit at least two more questions. And, and speaking about that, the things in our society that are driving some people towards extremism. A question is, do you see a relationship between wealth inequality and radicalization? Hmm. That's fascinating. That's a great question. Um, I think I think extremist groups often speak the language of anger and exclusion, and when you've got um, systems that leave people behind, that somehow uh, have have the perception that only the elites or only the um, wealthy can can exert their political will. Uh, or any other kind of will, I think that's a that's a very fertile ground for recruiters. 
um, you know, anger, anger and frustration at systems and authorities and not believing in anything, right. um, not believing in the institutions that exist, um, whether political or economic, I think certainly is a driver. And, and also what's so fascinating is, is Robert Papp, who you mentioned uh, has been doing research on this, revealed that many of the individuals who took part in the violent insurrection on January 6th and took over the US Capitol, they weren't poor. They were middle-class folks, you know? So anyone who sits there and goes, oh, it's all these poor people, it goes back to your point that you can't just, I think, stereotype uh, who gets radicalized. Exactly. But this whole point of the institution is against you, they don't have your back, they're oppressive, who do you trust, disinformation, and like you said, now we have COVID, a pandemic that has killed over 4 million people, and you have rampant disinformation, and you have efforts right here in the United States of America for another potential January 6th coup, um, and you have vaccine disinformation where people are literally eating horse paste and trying their best to deny people life-saving services like masks and vaccines. Someone could sit back and look and say, this is just a cauldron of, of, of just chaos. This is going to lead to violence and radicalization and civil war. And oh my God, what's going to happen? And people are terrified. And so for the final question, with the two minutes that we have left, it's, it's from a, a viewer. Did you walk away from this experience more hopeful or pessimistic? And I will just add to that, are you right now more hopeful or pessimistic with what you're witnessing happening in the world? I walked away optimistic because I really, I re in terms of, radicalization, I really feel that if, if, if we can rethink our lenses and rethink how we're gonna, how we're gonna try to con reconnect with each other, um, which I think is a real hunger. It's one of the hungers that drives extremism. We just have to you know, re you know, work ways to reach across the line. I actually was quite optimistic because I saw all these people doing innovative programs on a very local level that, that seemed to work. I'm not, I'm not saying all de-radicalization programs work. I'm not saying all prevention programs work, but getting away from a securitized lens and thinking about it as a community issue mm. really leaves me optimistic. Um, I think in also, um, we should take a page from like Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement and start thinking about the rise of extremism as a systemic thing rather than an individualistic thing. And if we start to do that, and if we learn from those movements, um, I would hope that, that there might be some rethinking. In terms of more broadly, <laughs> pessimism about the, the world, yeah, it's 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 a tough time to be optimistic, I've got to say. But um, you know, keep keep buggering on, as Winston Churchill said famously. And inshallah, as we say, God willing, hopefully the when the page turns, it brings with it a better story. Thank you, everyone, for coming by, for listening. The book is Homeland Security by Carla Power. It was released two weeks ago. Purchase it now. Thank you, New York Public Library, for the opportunity to talk to Carla about her book. And thank you, everyone who's watching at YouTube. I wish you well. Be safe. Be happy. And if possible, get vaccinated. That's just my two cents. <laughs> You're here. Take care, everyone. All right, we're done. Is that I it? Just awkwardly stare at each other right now. Or okay, all right, watch, thank you. Thank you for joining us. For more information and to register for upcoming programs, visit nypl.org live.